guys. <laughs> there you go. Thank you all for being here. We're very excited about this debate, not only because we believe it to be a question with massive implications for your lives now, but also for eternity later, but also because both teams have admitted to representing a particular worldview. By coming and agreeing to the question and debate, both teams have established that we are not neutral. Vocab and I are unashamedly committed to Jesus Christ as God, come in the flesh, the one who died for the sins of his people, conquered death, revealed himself in conscience, creation, scripture, and by taking flesh, dwelling among us, and by revealing God to us. That. Consequently, the one without whom this debate wouldn't make sense or even be possible. That is to say, we're defending Christian theism, not just any general form of theism. The truth claims and certainty of Christianity are based upon the revealed scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Omar and Sean have a pre-commitment to atheism, A, free being from without, and uh, theism from being theism or God. So they profess to not believe in the existence of God. Their denial of God's existence leads them in particular to an atheistic view of reality, knowledge, and ethics. What you're witnessing tonight is a collision. It's a collision of worldviews. Your job tonight is to act as judges. You must judge the debaters, because this is a debate about worldviews. You must test for consistency. It will be tremendously important to pay close attention to what each team is standing on, not literally standing on, but you must remember that each team has beliefs about reality, knowledge, logic, human value, and dignity, and I encourage you to watch for arbitrariness, mere personal opinions, or unfounded prejudicial conjecture, and watch for inconsistencies. Is the person acting consistently with what they say they are standing on? When their worldview doesn't work, are they forced to leave their platform in an attempt to borrow from the others? In my opening speech, I'd like to direct your attention to three specific points. Make it easy. Of observation to demonstrate that Christianity is the answer to tonight's question. The uniformity in nature, laws of logic, human value, and dignity. Number one, uniformity in nature. In philosophical terms, what we're describing here is what's called induction. Simply put, that the future will be like the past. All of us live in this world moment by moment, assuming that the future will be like the past. Science, logic, laboratory tests, medicine, historical examinations, and everything else are all impossible without it. Today we got out of bed and didn't think twice about gravity holding us down. We pull our covers aside and we assume that. All of us are sure to go to the bathroom this morning because based on past experience, we know there'll be problems if we don't, correct? <laughs> if I were to build a fire right here in the middle of the room and I was to ask everyone in the room to jump me by joining into it, what would you say? You see, nobody would join me jumping into this barbecue because based on past experience, you know that fire is hot and it will burn you. Nobody would be fooled into thinking that this, that this would be the best experience ever today rather than yesterday. Everyone assumes that the future would be like the past, but there, here is a devastating argument that exposes that atheists not only know God, but are demonstrating a secret dependence upon him to live in his world. Remember the worldview question. Atheism believes that the universe is a cosmic accident. All we have is time and chance acting on matter, just atoms banging around. There's no sovereign purpose, guidance, governing, and no reason to assume that tomorrow will be like today, or even that the next five seconds of this debate will be like the past. Like Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is all there is, was, or ever will be. It's just sound and fury, signifying nothing. Now, if you start with the God of the Bible, you can satisfy the preconditions of intelligibility for induction. We believe in a personal, all-powerful, sovereign God who carries this universe along to its intended destination, Hebrews 1.3. Christians have a reason for believing that the future will be like the past because we believe in a God who governs it by the word of his power. Second point, laws of logic. Imagine for a moment that to win tonight's debate, I came into the room and said something like this. To the governor, Would you expect me to win the debate like that? No, you wouldn't because something will be assumed tonight by both teams and by you, the audience. You see, both teams and you, the audience, will assume that there are universal laws of logic, that these laws are invariant, universal truths that we must hold to in order to live in this world and even have this debate. Remember again the worldview question. Atheists believe that the universe is unguided and therefore random. Atheists like Sean believe that all there is is matter in motion, just stuff moving around. Yet laws of logic are immaterial, abstract, universal entities. Let me simplify this. Have you ever tasted the law of non-contradiction? Has anyone ever tripped on a law of logic? Drank one, smelled one, tasted one? And yet, here we have atheists who believe that all that exists is matter, appealing to and using things which are not made of matter. To use an example from another well-known debate between Paul Manata and Dan Barker, imagine for a moment a person came into this room arguing that only marbles exist. All that exists is marbles, only marbles, all there is is marbles. But all the while, they, they were arguing, they were appealing to things not made of marbles. 
we would all notice that, that their argument is immediately refuted by the fact that they're appealing to things not made of marbles. Therefore, every time they speak, they'll be refuting their own ma most basic assumption about reality that all exists as matter. An atheistic outlook leaves us here tonight with four complex bags of protoplasm with noises coming out of the holes in the tops of our bags. In an atheistic worldview, there are no universals and nothing is necessary. Christians, however, can satisfy universal necessary in varying and abstract entities such as the laws of logic. Christians deny the claim that all that exists is matter. We believe in a God who is logic, John 1.1. 1, 1. To engage in contradiction is to engage in the nature of lying, and God cannot lie. We are made in his image and are to reflect the rationality and consistency that exists in his thinking and are to think his thoughts after him. On this point alone, when asking which worldview makes sense, atheism or Christianity, it is our contention that atheism makes appeals to logic senseless because it can offer no cogent philosophical justification for the use of universal, immaterial, and necessary laws. Therefore, Omar and Sean conceded the debate tonight by showing up. <laughs> Ultimately, we believe this evening's question will be answered and affirmed, and you need to hear this, as Christianity by both teams. By both teams. It'll be affirmed by us in what we say and what we're doing. It'll be affirmed by them in what they're doing, but will not say. Therefore, we encourage you to watch closely as our opponents continually give evidence of leaving their atheistic worldview to borrow from the Christian worldview in order to do what they're doing. They will assume the uniformity in nature, the rational intelligibility of the universe. They'll, they'll make claims about laws of logic, but you have to remember something. They'll also talk about human value and dignity, but you must remember that, that, that in their worldview, humans are merely protoplasm. We're just bags of biological stuff moving throughout a purposeless and meaningless universe. In denying that God exists and that we're made in the Imago Dei, atheists lose the right to be morally indignant when protoplasm bumps into protoplasm. We are simply dancing out our DNA. What a bag of fleshy chemicals does to another in a godless universe is wholly irrelevant. The Christian worldview teaches that all of us are created in the image of God who is infinitely valuable and good, thus we reflect his value and worth. On that basis, Christians can call evil, evil, and be real with it. And good, good, and be real with that. Half the time remains. Because we have an objective standard of good, God. Therefore, we invite you to watch as our opponents give visible evidence of depending upon the Christian worldview in order to argue against the Christian worldview. Thank you. The clock has stopped as vocab comes up to the mic. Thank you for coming out. We hope to do a lot more of these in the future. Uh, Jeff, focus on logic. I'm going to focus on history. My basic argument is that atheism cannot make sense of history's most significant event, the career of Jesus. Now, when an atheist looks into history, they are forced to give a variety of naturalistic explanations in order to account for anything not natural. So for the life of Christ, they have to do this, especially for the resurrection. But these explanations will fail to account for the evidence and they'll actually wind up making nonsense out of historical knowledge. The atheist has a handicap when investigating historical claims because they cannot accept any non-naturalistic explanations for events, even if they are superior. Now, an atheist may try to defend this prejudice by quoting David Hume, but listen, the a priori rejection of any and all miracle claims is a philosophical stance towards history. It is not a scientific stance towards history. But the good historian would keep their philosophical bias to a minimum. But unfortunately for the atheist, metaphysics get in the way of doing good history. This forces them, for example, to undervalue the New Testament documents. For hundreds of years, scholars, critical scholars, have been trying to get behind the four canonical Gospels. But still, even today, most non-believing historians recognize that these documents are hands down our earliest and best sources for the life of Jesus, all written in the first century. I refer our more ambitious audience members to the stellar work of Richard Bauckham, for evidence that the Gospels are indeed all linked directly in some way to eyewitness accounts. Now the fact that eyewitness testimony 
makes up the fabric of these documents is a challenge to the atheist's most basic assumption about reality because they contain miracles. But if one has not already ruled out God as creator, eyewitnesses reporting miracles by Jesus is not impossible, especially if it is true that Jesus of Nazareth is unique in human history in that he is God incarnate. If so, what would prevent the sovereign creator from entering into his creation if he so choose? And if he, do, if he did come and dwell amongst us, what would prevent him from possessing and utilizing divine power? And even though we know that the four Gospels are reliable, we can also get some information about Jesus from other sources, early non-Christian sources. For example, the Roman historian Cornelius Tacitus tells us in his annals that Christus was sacrificed, or I'm sorry, crucified, quote, during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus. Another hostile source, the Babylonian Talmud, tells us that, quote, on the eve of the Passover, Yeshu was hanged. Then he goes on to give the reason, because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Note the charge of sorcery. Even the adversaries of Jesus recognize his power and miraculous acts. They just question the source. Another non-Christian source, Josephus, tells us the disciples of Jesus, quote, reported, note that word, he says reported, that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion, that he was alive. Now remember, to the average Jewish person in those days, the idea of a crucified Messiah was a joke. But in the case of Jesus, we know that Jews and Gentiles alike not only recognized him as Messiah, but were actually worshiping him as God. How do Sean and Omar account for people treating a dead peer this way? Secular authors corroborate this fact of worship. Pliny the Younger wrote to the emperor around 112, reported that Christians got up early once a week to meet together, and they would sing hymns, quote, to Christ as to a God, Carmen Christi in Latin. What naturalistic explanation does the atheist want to use to explain how people were worshiping a man whom they knew only a generation or so before had been executed as a criminal? Historically, the atheist needs to posit a giant X factor into this equation. Dead Messiah plus X equals the birth and rise of Christianity. The atheist cannot make sense of why devout, Sabbath-keeping Jews suddenly began holding religious services on what is called Sunday. This transition makes sense if we recognize they were honoring the resurrection by a meeting on the day when it occurred. The atheist cannot make sense of how a group of zealous Jews who previously hoped for a military messiah to drive out the Romans suddenly began proclaiming as messiah one who said, put away your swords, turn your cheeks, pray for your enemies, and pay your taxes. The atheist cannot explain how a group of close circle ethnocentric Jews suddenly saw fit to take the message of Israel's messiah to all the nations. Two minutes. They cannot give a good answer as to why devout Jews who were, listen, fiercely monotheistic begin worshiping as God, a man who had dwelt among them. Did they lose their monotheism? Or did something happen that caused them to know that Jesus shared the very identity of Yahweh? The atheists cannot adequately account for why previously cowering fishermen will be willing to go to their deaths for refusing to deny the Lordship of Christ. Remember, they were in a position to know whether this event occurred or not. So analogies with hale bop comet chasers or jihadi warriors fail. These questions I'm asking of them are based on open facts of history about some really strange things that happened in first century Palestine. These are strange things that the atheists cannot make sense of in any meaningful way. One the Christian, however, can make sense of the life of the career of Jesus of Nazareth and all the odd events surrounding him, especially the resurrection. And it is this, Jesus Christ is a risen Lord. Thank you. I have way more material than I could possibly present. <laughs> So I'm going to talk fast. Uh, I'm very grateful for the invitation and opportunity to come and debate the question of which makes more sense, atheism or Christianity. I've known Milkamp for a few years, and we've had many conversations about these topics, and he's challenging me to debate him in a public setting on a number of occasions. 
I have never myself participated in a formal debate, and it's humbling for Sean and I to try and come and contend against two experienced orators as pastors Jeff and Bocap. We certainly don't have the experience or skill in public speaking that either of them do, and I hope you'll be patient with my attempts to communicate our position to you. By the same token, I'm pretty certain that a number of you are rooting or praying for our opponents, and I highly doubt that any of you are praying for us, but uh, I don't honestly believe that these supplications will have any effect either way. Uh, also, in the spirit of full disclosure, and to preemptively give credit where it's due, I am plagiarizing the majority of my arguments and material from Walter Sennett Armstrong, David Aronzi Steele, and Paul Davies. I'd like to start off this debate by saying that uh, I didn't personally have any say in the topic of this debate. It happens that I am an atheist, although that was not always the case, but I am not here to defend my views. The question is, which of the two alternatives, Christianity or atheism, makes more sense than the other? This presupposes that both Christianity and atheism do make some sort of sense. It should come as no surprise that atheism makes sense to an atheist, and that if you're a Christian, as many of you are, and as I was, that Christianity makes sense to you. Note that the question of whether something makes sense does not imply that it is correct. It might make sense that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west because it orbits the earth, but this is false. Note further that the question of whether something is logical and whether it makes sense are independent of one another. If you're a child and you read out cookies for Santa Claus on Christmas Eve, it would make sense that you would think he has been there if there were bites taken out of them on the following morning. But the conclusion Santa Claus exists does not follow logically from this observation. It is a non sequitur. There are numerous other possibilities I could explain it, and some are much more likely than the others. In this debate, we will depend upon logic to examine the forcefulness of the claims that are being made. A frequent tactic of Christians debating atheists is to assert that atheists cannot justify a recourse to logic because logic comes from God, but atheists don't believe in God. The question of whether a strictly materialistic worldview can justify the use of logic may well be an interesting question, although I think it is based on a number of faulty, unstated major premises, but I am not here to, to logically defend logicality. We concur that the universe seems to be a logical place and that we all have implicitly agreed upon the effectiveness of logic by assenting to a debate format. Another common tactic of Christians is to try to insist that atheism must be synonymous with monism, natural materialism, nihilism, postmodernism, or what have you. Now, I may or may not be any of those things, or believe in any of those things, um, and the question of what makes more sense, natural materialism, for example, or Christianity, might be an interesting topic for debate, but it is not the topic of this debate. To conflate atheism with a category of atheism, even if it were the most popular type, amounts to a straw man or a red herring or a straw herring. As an example, I cannot presently conclude that we have been successful if we show that atheism makes more sense than Catholicism, since Catholicism is the most popular statistically type of Christianity. That is not the topic in question. To make things more simple, we will appeal to standard dictionary definitions. The Oxford English Dictionary defines atheism as disbelief in the existence of God or gods, and Christianity as the religion based on the person and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth or its beliefs and practices. Two things are immediately obvious. First, Christianity is a religion, and atheism is not. Christianity is comprised of teachings, beliefs, and or practices. Atheism is comprised of only a single disbelief, or the rejection or absence of a single belief. Atheism is not a creed to live by. Some Christians will try to def define atheism as a religion or a worldview like Christianity is, but it's hard to see how disbelief in a single type of thing can constitute a religion or worldview. Otherwise, disbelief in unicorns would also be a religion. Newborn babies do not have a belief in unicorns, or God, for that matter. Are they born atheists? Implicitly, Christianity is more demanding than atheism. It is not enough to form a mental concept of Jesus to believe that Jesus exists, to be a Christian. Most Christians today would say that, would, would insist that Christianity entails an acceptance of Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world, the Son of God the Father, and Creator of the universe, as revealed in His Word, the Bible. All that is required for atheism is a single belief, or its lack thereof. Leaving aside more obscure movements like Christian atheism, we see that the categories of Christianity and atheism are mutually exclusive. One cannot simultaneously hold the belief that Jesus is the Son of God, and that no God exists. Now, there are many ways of being a Christian, as demonstrated by the number of sects and denominations that consider themselves such. And it seems that for just about any way a group defines Christianity, you can find another group who's willing to dispute it. So the first question to ask ourselves is, if the way to be Christian so fundamental is the way to be Christian is so fundamentally unclear that Christians themselves cannot agree on what it means, what does it mean to say that Christianity makes sense? There are at least as many ways of being an atheist as there are ways of not being a Christian, and in fact, many more. But the difference in the case of varieties of atheism is that because atheism itself 
requires so very little, these ways it need not be mutually contradictory. You can disbelieve that God exists in conjunction with any of countless other beliefs or worldviews, but accepting that Jesus is the Son of God and that the Bible is his word seems to impose severe restrictions on the types of worldviews one can reconcile to it. This is not true of atheism. By definition, atheism does not strictly demand any other kinds of beliefs. You can disbelieve in the existence of God and yet believe, for example, in karma, animism, dualism, some sort of supernatural realm, ghosts, ESP, extraterrestrial intelligences, etc., which is not to say that those beliefs follow logically from the non-existence of God, but there is no reason that atheism is logically incompatible with any of these. There are a number of predominantly Eastern religions that are essentially atheistic, composed of more than one billion people worldwide. Buddhism, Jainism, Taoism, Confucianism, traditional Chinese religion, Falun Gong, Shinto, not to mention, or, not to mention secular humanism, and universalism in the West. Now that we have defined atheism, let's take a look at the God Christianity requires. This being can be called the God of classical theism, and he has agreed to be all-powerful, all-knowing, good, timeless, creator of everything, etc. It is not enough for Christianity to say that God is all-powerful, but not completely good, or the creator of most things, and pretty powerful. Although in most ages of history, people who believed in anything that might be referred to as a god did not believe in any entity that possessed all of these attributes, Absolutely, and there is nothing that logically precludes these lesser gods from existing, but Christianity today requires a deity to exhibit all of these characteristics fully. The first problem is that it is difficult to reconcile these concepts about God with some of the accounts we have of him in the Bible, or with reality as we observe it. And the second problem is that something that possesses all of these attributes is a logically impossible being. No being that possesses all of these attributes exists. To say that God is a person means that he has a mind, albeit a brainless one, intentions, and acts in accordance with them. He has thoughts, makes choices, and in the Bible expresses emotions. To say that God is a spirit means that his existence is not physical, not made of matter or energy, and not detectable through any empirical method. If God is omnipotent, he can do anything he likes, though theists usually insist that he can only do logically possible things. This means that God is constrained by logic in a very fundamental way. It makes no sense to posit that the source of the laws or regularities of the universe can only be God when God is apparently subject to the regularities of the universe. And for your point. has been stopped. The clock will restart when Sean speaks. This is my first time uh, doing anything like this too, and so you know, I hope I'll, I'll do a decent job. But first I want to tell you about the ancient uh, Hebrew cosmology. Just like everyone around them, the authors of the Bible believed in a very different kind of world than we believe in today, or that we know exists today. Essentially, the Bible describes the uh, Earth as a giant reversed snow globe with the water on the outside. There are pillars of the Earth which hold up the land, and there are pillars of heaven which hold up the firmament. The firmament is a... Sorry. I, I didn't switch the song. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, the, the firmament is the dome that's covering the whole earth there. And uh, it holds out the water that's up above it. And it has little, the stars are just little things up in the firmament and they can actually fall to earth. Uh, there are also windows in heaven that water can come down through. I'm going to focus on the firmament itself, uh, since it's an integral part of this uh, view of the world. And we know that it was, it was accepted by Christians, Jews, and just about everyone else in the world until long after the New Testament was written. The reason this view is so common is that the world as we see it with our eyes you know, is, is very much like this. Uh, if you were to go up to the top of a mountain and look all around you, you would see... Uh, you know, what looked like a, a fairly flat world that, that, you know, essentially looks like that. Uh, so people tended to believe that that was the way it actually was. Uh, the, the people who actually helped us leave this worldview behind lived long after the authors of the Bible. And in many cases, they were actually held back by their beliefs in, in uh, biblical uh, things or, or persecuted by Christians uh, who did support the Bible in, in opposition to what we actually saw. In fact, there seems to have been very little progress in Christian cosmology in the 1200 years between the 3rd century uh, or theologian origin 
who said uh, the, the firmament is without doubt firm and solid, and Protestant founder Martin Luther. I don't, I don't think this thing is working. Um, it just if I hold it up, switch the slide. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. Uh, Martin Luther was always uh, one to jettison reason and reality in favor of the Bible, and you can see him here uh, recommending that you also do that. You can also see a picture uh, from his own version of the Bible depicting the way he saw the world based on what the Bible says. At least it takes into account the fact that the earth is spherical, which was undeniable by that point, but still he has this solid firmament and you know, a, a very different kind of world than what we actually see. It shouldn't be too surprising that they believe in a solid firmament, though, because the that's what the very first chapter of the Bible tells us about. Um, and God made the firmament which divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. Uh, a lot of people try to take this to be some kind of a figurative thing, but it, it was meant literally. They, they believed that there was water up above that. The description of the firmament in Genesis 1 was meant just as it sounds. Um, it's, even supposed to, it's not even supposed to be that high up. Even God himself believes in the Bible that it's possible for people to build a tower to reach the firmament where he lives, as we can see in the story of the Tower of Babel. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. He was actually worried that they'd be able to build their tower all the way up to heaven, so he came down to stop them, considering that the Jewish Talmud claims that some of the tower's builders intended to start a war against God, maybe he had reason for it. There's another interesting version of the story in the Greek apocalypse of Baruch, which didn't make it into the Bible. In this version, though, the tower is actually completed, and they try to dr drill through the surface of the firmament to see if it's made of clay, brass, or iron. I don't think I can sum it up any better than this quote from Paul H. Seeley, an evangelical Christian author writing in the Westminster Theological Journal. Certainly anyone denying the solidity of the firmament in Genesis 1 bears in a heavy burden of proof. It seems to me that nothing short of a clear statement to the contrary made by an Old Testament writer could allow one in good conscience to set aside this clear historical meaning. This is supposed to be a set of books divinely inspired by the all-knowing creator of the universe, and it do yet it doesn't come close to matching up with reality. This is why Christianity does not make sense. It's, it's not unexpected that the ancient Hebrews would have a similar worldview to that of their neighbors, though, especially considering that they were, if anything, less, not more advanced than the other people in the area. Less than two minutes. The Bible itself tells us that they were still using uh, bronze tools while the, and weapons while the, their neighbors had moved on to iron. Apparently, not only did God not teach them how to work with iron, but he wasn't even powerful enough to... Uh, helped defeat other tribes who used it, as we can see in Judges 1.19. Uh, sorry, uh, one more. <laughs> and the Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountains, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron. The God of the Old Testament is really a very human God. When it says that man is created in his image, it's not too far from the truth. The roles are just reversed. He's jealous, vain, and cruel. He's not omniscient, omnipotent, or omnipresent. Just like he came down from heaven to look at the Tower of Babel, he personally comes down to earth a number of times, to, as do Satan and angels, who incidentally give, uh, have hybrid children with women, human women, in Genesis 6, right before God shows another human trait and regrets having made humans, after which he proceeds to drown all but eight of them. Is this one of the parts that's supposed to make sense? Another human trait that God has is a sense of smell. The Bible talks literally dozens of times about how the aroma of burning flesh is pleasing to the Lord, and it says four different times that he gets all of the fat. Apparently, God really likes burning fat. Do these things make sense for the kind of God that Christian, Christians believe in today? I, hopefully, I can get through the rest of this uh, another portion. Um,
that concludes the opening statements. We move on to the next round of rebuttals or responses. Each team will have eight minutes. Jeff and Vocab go first. Time starts when Jeff speaks. Well, we need to really look here tonight and just, just really describe that our opponents really are running out of time to make their case that atheism makes sense. They've really minimized the task that was set before them this evening by saying that atheism is simply one thing, a denial of God's existence, and that's all they required. Can you imagine for a moment if I were to walk into this room and, and speak to you in that way? I just have a belief that God exists, but it makes no impact on anything else that I believe. I don't view the world in a certain way. I don't view people in any way because of my belief in God. I have one belief that God exists, and it affects nothing else. You see, they've minimized the task before them by saying that their atheism is just a belief, and people have different... What we're saying to you guys tonight is this, is that no particular atheistic world you can make sense out of induction, laws of logic, or the uniformity in nature, or human value and dignity. Important for you guys to, to, to respond to that. So when they say Christianity can't agree on what Christianity is, well, this is just what the glorious thing about God is, is that God has not only revealed himself in creation and conscious, but also he's revealed himself through his word and ultimately in his son. So God has spoken so we can have certainty about what he says. Now, when they say Christians can't agree on, on what Christianity is, well, that's, that's an interesting claim to make because in 2 John verse 9, John says in the first century, when people who are coming in teaching false teaching, he says, if anyone does, if goes too far, does not abide in the teaching of Christ, he does not have God. So, Omar, the answer to your question is, the answer to what a Christian is, is those who follow the apostolic teaching of Jesus Christ, those, those who follow the word of God. In other words, if you speak Christianese, but you deny what God says, you are not a Christian. Simply A cannot be non-A. And so we need to really get into the most important parts of the debate tonight, and that's here. On the one hand tonight, you have two atheists claiming there is no God. So there's no personal order or plan and no governing of this universe, just blind, purposeless, or random forces acting on matter. They can claim that, but is that how they're living tonight? No. You heard all these things about science, and he was butchering texts of the Bible and everything else. We can get into that, by the way, in cross-examination. But their claim is the exact opposite of what they're standing on. They're assuming that nature is what? Uniform. That's what they stand on. But their atheism is randomness and chance. That is what they say. Haven't we all noticed that they're appealing to the universe as uniform and, and not random, and it's in fact predictable? Ladies and gentlemen, you can't bring those things together. That is to say, the atheist is a bag of contradictions because he can't make his worldview work with what he is doing. Atheists try to reconcile this obvious conflict by saying we can appeal to the uniformity in nature because we observe that the universe exhibits uniformity. But you see, that just begs the question, doesn't it? And you see, atheist philosophers like Bertrand Russell would point that out to our opponents because he argued forcefully that regularity in the past does not justify an appeal to regularity in the future. Imagine for a moment an atheist challenging a Christian to give a cogent reason, a justification for his belief in God's existence. And the Christian responded, <clears throat> because he just does. The atheist wouldn't accept that answer, and we can't accept it from the atheist. We are asking these atheists... What justifies their proceeding on the expectation that the future be like the past? They will argue for the necessity to be consistent. You heard that tonight. Logical problems and this and that. But it's interesting, you've got to see that when they argue for logic and, and, and reason, that their naturalistic view of life is basically all as matter in motion. Their worldview cannot provide the preconditions of intelligibility for immaterial, unchanging, and universal laws of logic. Remember, friends, that the laws of logic aren't made of matter. Sometimes the atheist tries to provide an answer for this by saying that logic, that logic is, a, is just a social convention, but people simply just agree on what logic is. Well, if that were the case, then vocab and I just conventionally decide tonight all who argue in favor of Christianity are being logically consistent. All who argue in favor of atheism are logically inconsistent. You see, it's just totally arbitrary. Atheists will sometimes say the laws of logic are something that happens inside our brains. But you see, if that were true, then the atheist has just undermined human freedom and the universal necessity of logic. What's happening in their brains is not the hap thing happening in, in our brains Halfway. because we're not sharing the same brains. Ultimately, when the atheist rejects God's existence and believes he is just the result of random chance occurrences, time and, ch and chance acting on matter, then he's not thinking, he's just fizzing. Sort of like dropping a Mentos into a Coke bottle will cause it to chem fizz, uh, chemically fizz. Dropping a Bible into Omar and Sean's lap will cause them to chemically fizz atheistic thoughts. That's where atheism leaves you. And so atheism is left with no justification for the laws of logic. Thank you. We're going to stop. We're going to with OCAP's first word. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Omar. Um, I didn't hear any good reasons why atheism makes sense. I heard a patchwork of misinterpreted scriptures from Sean, and then the atheist did his atheistic skeptics annotated Bible hermeneutic, which should never be trusted, and then said, look, this makes no sense, Christians. I wanted to know why atheism made sense. That was a question I was waiting to hear. Let's just say everything Sean said about Hebrew cosmology is correct. It does not follow atheism makes any sense at all. In fact, while trumpeting the achievements of modern science as well we should, he has no justification for why we can do science. Science presupposes a number of things, most importantly, the laws of logic. Atheism, while liking science, doesn't like the parent. It likes the child only. The parent is the mind of God. Laws of logic are not material, and atheistic worldview cannot account for them. Omar came close when he said, we've agreed they're effective. We have agreed they're effective, but is that all they are? Is that all the laws of logic are? If so, we can change them and agree that a different set of laws of logic are effective. Two minutes. Now, I wish we could go through some of these texts, but I think this might be helpful. To read a comparative cosmology from some of Israel's neighbors, and maybe that will help us see the way their cosmologies looked. The incarnation of this God, this is Egyptian, cycle of the sun. The incarnation of this God enters at a, her first hour of evening, becoming effective again in the embrace of his father Osiris, and becoming purified therein. The incarnation of this God rests from life in the duat at her second hour of pregnancy. Then the incarnation of this God is governing the Westerners and giving directions in the duat. Then the incarnation of this God comes forth on earth again, having come into the world young, his physical strength growing great again, like the first occasion of his original state. Then he is evolved into the great God, the winged disc. When this God sails to the limits of the base of the sky, she causes him to enter again into night, into the middle of the night. As he sails inside the disc, these stars are behind them. One minute. If you could go through this, you could see it's an Egyptian explanation for the sun. God made the sun on the fourth day, and just so the Hebrews wouldn't worship, it says, created a greater light and a lesser light. They didn't even use sun because a lot of terminology with sun had cultic connotations then. You have in Genesis, creation ex nihilo, out of nothing, which if they hold the Big Bang cosmology, in a certain sense they agree with. Out of nothing. There's no battle of gods, and then from someone's body drop the universe, which other ancient cosmologies do. Greatly different. And the reason is because God made it and knows. There are no windows or pillars. Look at those verses and see if they say what the atheists really say in regards to the universe. But you do have a God calling things into existence that were not. And we can trust this God to make sense of the universe because he made it. Can the atheist make sense of why we can even make Time. sense of the universe? Laws of logic. <laughs> we now move on. We have a rebuttal period for the atheist team, Omar and Sean. Whoever you decide to go first, your time will begin when Sean will speak. You have eight minutes. You say that we don't have any reason for believing in uniformity in nature. And that we have to borrow from their worldview where God makes things the way they are. The problem is that we, we don't actually know exactly why uh, the, the universe that we are in came into existence. We don't know exactly what is beyond it or why the, the laws that actually do govern it are there. That doesn't mean that the best, best explanation for it is a you know, supernatural uh, omnipotent creator. The best, best explanation is most likely something else natural because that is all we see. And we do see the, the reasons for things working the way that they do. There are specific laws such as gravity and uh, uh, you know, electromagnetism, uh, things that, that we, we understand fairly well how they work and how, they, how matter interacts with other matter. 
and that's all that it takes for for us to be able to live in a, a universe that makes sense where things do continue to happen the way they've happened in the past because we still have these same laws governing all matter in the universe likewise the laws of logic they're not they're not exactly a material thing but they are a description of the interaction of material things. <coughs> Jeff said, has anyone ever drank a law of logic? The real question is, has anyone ever taken a drink and not taken a drink at the same time? It's, it's all about the interaction of matter. It's not... That, that is why logic works. Because of matter, not because of uh, some immaterial law that's laid out by a god. We'll stop the clock. <clears throat> we'll start it up when Omar speaks. Okay, so Jeff and Vocab, or mainly Jeff, went back to talking about how atheism presupposes a certain type of worldview. Well, that's simply false. I and mean, we looked at the dictionary definition of atheism. It doesn't presuppose any type of worldview. We have a billion atheists in China and they don't all have a materialistic worldview. Well, how do you explain that? Um, Jeff talked about the arbitrariness of an atheistic worldview. What is arbitrary is that if there is a God who declares what good is and what evil is, either it's good and evil because he says it's good and evil, or it's good and evil because there's something pre-existing which dictates what good and evil would be. If that's the case, then either goodness and evil is arbitrary, or it's dependent on a pre-existing law of existence. If God is perfectly good, he could do no wrong and never could. This seems to uh, pose serious limitations for a person who is omnipotent. There are a lot of things that an all-powerful being cannot do if he cannot do any wrong. Another problem is what is known as the Euthypro dilemma. Is it actually good because God demands it, or does he demand it because it's good? If he demands it because it's good, then it cannot be said that God is an arbiter of goodness, rather that he is subject to goodness. Goodness would, not, would be another regularity of the universe that precedes God, and the postulation of God's existence is what is supposed to explain the regularities of the universe. But if an action is good because God demands it, it doesn't make any sense to say that goodness, whatever that is, isn't arbitrary, which is just the problem Christians accuse atheists of being unable to resolve. So, if God could arbitrarily decree it good to slaughter your enemies, take their possessions, enslave their wives, use their daughters for procreative purposes, and smash the heads of their babies on rocks, as has been done in the Old Testament, then it wouldn't make any sense to call this being good in any meaningful way. This would be a being that arbitrarily decides what goodness is. Another one of uh, Jeff's comments was that there's no way to talk about the uniformity of nature unless you're a Christian. Well, this is simply not true. Uh, I like to quote Paul Davies because Christians love to quote Paul Davies. They think that he's a pantheist, he's on their side. Uh, what, what Paul Davies is as a physicist, and he, his position on God does not support the Christian worldview in the least. He says that science is founded on the hope that the world is rational in all its observable aspects. That's what science is. If a plausible scientific theory can be constructed that will explain the origin of the entire physical universe, then we at least know that a scientific explanation is possible whether or not the current theory is right. Uh, he also says many people like to believe in God's role as a prime mover, a first cause in a cosmic chain of causation. But what does it mean for a God who is outside of time, as God is supposed to be to cause anything? It doesn't make any sense. Because of this difficulty, believers in a timeless God prefer to emphasize his role in upholding and sustaining the creation at every moment of its existence. But how is a God outside of time able to uphold or do anything? This is something that actually has occurred to Christian theologians in the last hundred years, and they started to move away from this argument. Uh, Jeff also talked about the fact that for an atheist, the entire entire existence is some kind of cosmic accident. This is simply not true. Again, to quote uh, Paul Davies, the success of science is, at, in the very least, very strong circumstantial evidence in, the favor, in favor of the rationality of nature. In science, if a certain line of reasoning is successful, we pursue it until we find it to fail. Has it failed? Has anyone ever taken a, a, a glass of, uh, what do you say, a glass of rationality and... Uh, actually manage to do it? No, because you can't possibly do something that is logically impossible. Um, 
These two know very well that it is impossible to use a something like logic to demonstrate the, the proof of itself. That's something that's log logically self-contradictory. Less than two minutes. I have another comment about the cosmic accident. Uh, why must the universe have a cause at all? Quantum mechanics shows us that uncaused events happen all the time. The existence of a universe without an external first cause need no longer be regarded as conflicting with the laws of physics. This conclusion is based in particular on the application of cosmology to quantum physics. Given the laws, the existence of the universe is itself not miraculous. Now, a Christian will say, well, how do you explain the fact that the universe appears to be so perfectly fine-tuned for the existence of life, or the existence of logic? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, if you look at fine-tuning, when we talk about the laws of nature, what we are saying is that the universe exhibits certain regularities. The law of nature is not a law in a legal sense, decreed by some divine authority. The theist will want to say that any regularity at all requires further explanation. One minute. This claim rests on the assumption that if there is no God, we should expect there to be no regularities in nature. There seems to be no reason to make this assumption. Suppose that our God did decree all the physical laws of our universe. Still, there must be other natural laws that apply to God. Any truth about the way that reality operates is a natural law. If it's true that everything that God wills comes about, then that is a natural law. If it's true that God can think, then there must be laws governing his mental processes. So even if there is a God, and even if God determined the laws of nature for our universe, God himself still must be subject to impersonal natural law. Three seconds. But if, there's, if there must be natural laws to which God is subject, then we cannot say that any natural laws demand an explanation in terms of God. And this goes for natural laws of the universe. We see that this worldview, the idea that natural law can only come from a god, itself presupposes that god is subject to certain types of worldviews, that he cannot do things that are logical and impossible. This doesn't make any sense. A, Christ, a Christian must necessarily adopt a worldview that is self-contradictory. <laughs> Now both teams will move to the cross-examination round, where there will be ten minutes for each team to cross-examine the other. We'll begin with Jeff and Vocab doing cross-examination of Omar and Sean first. The ten-minute period that you have to do the cross-examination will start with your first word. And for the audience, a reminder that during the cross-examination, essentially, the team that's doing the cross-examination has the moderating power in their hand to direct these 10 minutes. All right, uh, Sean, thank you, Omar. Sean, thank you guys for being here, by the way. Thanks. Uh, Sean, you had stated that, uh, what's that? <laughs> Sean, you said that we don't know why, uh, why the universe or how it came into existence. We don't know why the laws that govern it are there. Is that correct? We, we do have ideas about it, but we don't know definitively. So you point. don't know. So at that point, you live by faith. <laughs> no, I I don't I don't claim to know. That's the so. But, but you you I, I accept that I don't know. Right, but you're assuming something about the universe and about the future of the universe, but you have no explanation, and and that's not faith. No, I I am accepting that the most likely explanation for it is something natural. I don't know for sure what that explanation so, will turn out so, to be. Yet. So you preclude the possibility of any supernatural. So your, your naturalism no, drives I, your decision. I see no evidence for anything supernatural. Okay. And, and it, until I That's see some evidence for something supernatural, I can't believe okay. it. Okay. Um, do you believe in a sovereign God who governs the universe? No. No. Do you believe that your... Uh, do you, do you, would you agree that your beliefs require a reason or justification? Yes. And do you believe that the future will be like the past or that nature is uniform? Yes. You do. What's your philosophical justification? I'm asking you for the justification, the satisfaction for the preconditions of intelligibility, for appealing to induction, and, and again, not using the past, because that would be begging the question, but the future. What's your future justification? It's, it's not about the past or the future. It's about the, the actual physical universe. It, you know, it, it works the way it works. And it, as far as we know, it's going to continue to work that way. And this is another faith commitment of yours. <laughs> I, I believe that the universe will work the way that it's worked for the last 33 years of my life. By faith. I don't, I don't know that it will, so I, I, I believe that it will. Okay, so would you, and I read you a quote from atheistic philosopher Bertrand Russell on induction. He's an atheist, by no the way. Reason to believe that it was. Okay, it has been argued that we have reason to know that the future will resemble a past because what was the future has constantly become the past, 
and has always been found to resemble the past. So we really have experience of the future, namely of times which were formerly future, which we may call past futures. But such an argument really begs the very question and issue. That's what he's saying about what you're saying. We have experience of past futures, but not of future futures. And the question is, will future futures resemble past futures? This question is not to be answered by an argument which stands from past futures alone. We have therefore still, this is an atheist, to seek for some principle which shall enable us to know that the future will follow the same laws as the past. What's your answer to Bertrand Russell's problem of induction? Again, there is no reason to believe that it won't. That, that doesn't mean that it necessarily will, but and until you give me a reason to think that tomorrow well, you gravity can, I, won't I, work. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm asking really the questions right now, Sean. So, uh, given your disbelief in God and naturalistic worldview, are we required to follow absolute laws of logic? Yes. Are we required to use absolute uh, to follow them? Um, yes. Yes. I, I mean, they aren't laws, though, actually. They, they are just a description of the way the universe works. So are they something that happens in minds, or are they social no, conventions? neither. They're neither? No. So, so the laws of logic don't happen in minds, and they're not socially decided upon. The, what we call the laws of logic are our conceptions of these things, but the reality of these things is just the interaction between matter. So, laws of logic are material? Yes. Okay, could you put one in my hand, please? We've already gone through this a bunch of times. I, well, well, material means made of matter, right? Correct? Yes. And so, if a law of logic is made of matter, it's, can you spin that out on the table? It is based on the interaction between matter. Betw matter interacting with matter, you're still coming back to the same point, though. You're saying that laws of logic are material. Can I answer the question? Absolutely. Okay. okay. So, um... The question was whether the laws of logic would be something that you could put in your hand. Now, laws of logic, like any are law... Are they material? Are they material? In nature. No, I would say a law, a law of the universe is not material. So you disagree uh, with Sean at that point? I, I do disagree with Sean. Okay. I would say that uh, a law of the universe, or a law of nature, as being described, refers to a certain regularity of the universe. In the same way you couldn't put gravity in your hand, you couldn't put... Uh, an attribute of the way the universe appears to look into your hand. That Thank you, Omar. Uh, Omar, um, uh, are laws of logic universal? Uh, as far as we know. As far I, as I, I don't know of any exceptions. Any, any place where laws of logic can, don't can you explain this is a place. Okay, Pardon. Omar, thank you. Can, can you explain how uh, a, a denial of God's existence, a denial of God's existence, would lead you to a, have a justification for universals at all? So say that again. How would, uh, with your denial of God's existence, how would you justify an appeal to any universal at all? If all we are is atoms banging around, uh, how do we get universal? I don't think I said that all we are is atoms banging around. No, I'm, I'm making that assumption. Uh, well, that's, maybe that's an erroneous assumption. Okay. Well, are you a materialist? Am I a materialist? Am I here to defend materialism? Well, I'm asking you personally, are you a materialist? I'm not here to defend my personal does your I'm here, denial to, I'm here to, to say whether atheism makes sense. Or right, okay. Does your denial of God's existence lead you to believe that all that exists is matter? Not necessarily. Okay, not necessarily? There could be other things aside from matter. Uh, obviously, uh, forces are not made of matter. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm going to change the track a little bit. Omar, do you believe, or this is one, do you believe that we can actually know what happened in the past? Can we have historical absolute knowledge? certainty? No, of course not. But can we know? With absolute certainty? I didn't say with absolute. Can I know what with, happened? Within, can within, we know what happened 10 minutes ago? Within degrees of re reasonability or probability, we can know. Yes, with qualifications. With qualifications. Okay. We can have an idea. Do you believe that we can know Julius Caesar crossed the Rhine? Is that is it possible to be known? It can't, it's not something that we can replicate, it, so. Um, if we have good reason, if we have evidence that it occurred, we can know within a degree of probability, but it doesn't mean we can know for certain. Do you believe that Alexander the Great was King Philip's son? I don't know if that's a historical fact. I don't know if it's true. The historical facts you do know, how do you know them? How do I know the facts that I know? Mm -hmm. uh, I learned them. How do you learn them? How do I learn? I learn things the same way you learn things. How, how do I learn historical facts then? <laughs> how do you learn them? Yes. I assume that you gain the information and you decide if it makes sense or if it doesn't make sense, and you compare it to other things that you know about the universe, and okay, that, that becomes knowledge. When we're talking about Alexander, does it bother you that his two principal biographies were written 400 years after his death? Does that bother you? 
I never really thought about it. Does it bother you? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, does it bother you, Sean? Not particularly, because I don't have any kind of faith in Alexander. You don't think he existed? I, I think he probably did, but I don't then know. You do have some faith in him. <laughs> you have some faith in historical knowledge, do you not? It's not unreasonable that he existed. If you said that he okay. walked across the Rhine, then that would be something that would require some does sort it, of evidence. With the, does it concern you that the Gallic Wars, from which we got a lot of information about Caesar, Julius Caesar, were written around 50 BC, but our earliest copy is from 980. Does that bother you? I really don't see how that's relevant. I didn't ask you to tell me if you thought it was relevant. I said does it bother you. At this moment, uh, I'm not bothered. Does it concern you, Sean? No, I, I. Okay, no. I think does it that, concern you? Does it concern you? We only have about ten copies of said Gallic Wars. I think that it, it is a concern in uh, trying to t determine whether or not the information in, in it is true. Less than two. Minutes. Why do you think I'm asking you these questions? <laughs> Probably because it relates to the uh, historical uh, manuscript evidence for Christianity. Well, not just that, but we have biographies of Jesus within the. Lifetime of eyewitnesses. Even if you don't think it was written by eyewitnesses, you cannot deny it would be within their lifetime. And we have copies quickly after when they're written. For example, John, written, let's say 100. We have copies from 125. Now, why are you so less certain about Jesus than you are Caesar? I assume, because you, you, what's the problem? The problem is that when you look at these accounts, which no one claims that they were eyewitnesses, and both of you know, you, you've been to seminary, you know that these accounts in mainstream theology, uh, these no one considers these accounts. I will deal with this in my remodel, it's a false point. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So the fact that we have, when we look at these accounts and we look at the, the chronology of when they were written, you can see how the accounts change over time. When we look at Mark, written at best maybe 30 years after the death of Christ, and then Mark and, Mark and then Matthew and Luke, and then you look at John, the story completely changes. By the time you get to John, you have a... Completely um, changes! You have, a, you have an entirely embellished story. Now, when you look at the closest Christian documents that you have, the letters of Paul, these documents don't mention anything about the, the uh, miracle, the so-called miracle of uh, Jesus' birth. Could, you, could we stop there? Do, does, does Paul's documents mention the miracle of resurrection? Paul does talk about the resurrection. Okay. Well, I think they mentioned a pretty big miracle, then, wouldn't you agree? It seems to uh, omit a large number of miracles. I Did, was Paul writing a biography of Jesus somewhere? Was he? Yes. He was writing letters. Okay. Are, are we done? Or do we have 10 seconds? Okay. Um, so, I would say this, that, that the real reason is your supernaturalistic bias, and that you can only accept material, Time. naturalistic explanations, gets in the way of your history. Now, the cross-examination is in the hands of Omar and Sean, and they'll be cross-examining vocab and Jeff. Okay, and your ten minutes begins with your first question. Okay, I have a few questions. Can you tell me what are the attributes of God? Well, um, I'll give you a few. I mean, he's he's pretty awesome, so it's hard to put him. In awesome, words. awesome one. Yeah, awesome is one. There you go. He's infinite. Uh, he is all powerful. He is good. He is holy. He is righteous. Okay, that's um, good. That's good. Okay. What does it mean? He's to... Trinity, by the way. He's Trinity. Okay, what does it mean to, if he is infinite? What does that mean exactly? Does he contain an infinite number of items? An infinite amount of. He's infinite in all his attributes. So when I say, for example, that um, uh, I wouldn't just say God is loving, I would say God is love. Is he, is he also infinite hate? No. He doesn't contain you know, hate. hate. Hate would be the opposite of his of his character, and that actually goes back to a point you made, which is might actually help him. So God doesn't actually hate. He, he, doesn't, doesn't, he doesn't hate anything. anything. Does God hate? Now, when I, when I when you raise the question of hate, I'm assuming you're meaning like a, a moral or evil hate. I just mean the opposite of love. Yeah. Does Does God um, love less? Yeah, absolutely. Does, does he hate examples no. of hate? No. Does yes, he hate. God hates sin. Absolutely. Does he hate perfectly and infinitely? Oh, sure, absolutely. Okay, so God is infinite love and infinite hate. He is infinite in all of his attributes. Of he, con he contains self-contradictory attributes, both love and hate, infinitely. Well, well, hold on now. That's not a problem from my worldview. And it's, I don't see it as a self-contradiction either. He's infinite in all of his attributes. It's not a, that's not a self-contradiction if he's infinite in all of his attributes. It's not a problem for my worldview. It's a problem for is yours. He, is he infinitely... What does it mean if he's infinitely powerful? What does that actually mean? That God has limitless power. So he can do anything. Well, anything that's according to his nature. For example, we say these, these, sometimes these games we play, can God 
create a rock too heavy that he can't lift. Well, that'd be a contradiction because God is all-powerful. He wouldn't create something contrary to his own nature. That is all-powerful. So he wouldn't do it. Not that he couldn't. He wouldn't. He, yeah, exactly. Okay, so could he uh, create... For example, God cannot lie. God cannot lie. Because against his character. <laughs> okay, so if he's omnipotent, is it possible... Now, I'm not talking about God now. Is it possible for something to exist that is simultaneously... Uh, something that is infinitely destructible, which means that... It, it can destroy anything to exist at the same time as something which is infinitely indestructible. Could anything in the universe, could we have two objects, those two existing at the same time in this universe? Sure. So something with, sure in, something with infinite power to destroy and something which is infinitely undestroyable, could that exist in this universe? Or is that a logical impossibility? Well, you know, I, I'll, I'll try to answer your question, but at some point along the way, Omar, you're going to have to remember that the topic of the debate is which world you make sense or which makes more sense. Yeah, I'm trying to make sense of how does this concept of God make, make well, sense. Well, you're asking, what you're doing now is you're asking, you're asking a, a theological question about, I guess, I'm assuming nature of some sort. I'm just trying to understand how is it that God can have these attributes which seem to cancel each other out. He can destroy anything. Well, again, I'll, I'll answer but then he, he's straight also answer. I'll make it a straight answer for you. He is infinite in all of his attributes, and he is holy, pure, righteous, and good, in all of them. And he knows, he knows every fact. Not only does God know every fact, Omar, he doesn't just take in knowledge of facts. How, how do we know that he knows Omar, every you fact? Omar, you gotta let me finish the question. I, I don't think I have to. Actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> how, do we, how do we know that God actually knows God, every fact? Hold on one second. Uh, God is infinite in his knowledge, and not only does he know things... Well, how do you know that? Well, how do you know? I'm going to explain it to you. you. Well, that's a question you should have known before you came to the debate, Omar. But that's, this is the God purpose became of the flesh and revealed himself to us. That's how I, I know think, I don't think he can make points during my cross-examination. No, I'm answering. No, you're not answering my question. My well, question... I'm not trying to, Omar, listen. I, the original point you had made, I was trying to answer. You asked me, does God know all things? And I was trying to tell you uh, that not only does God know all things, but he decrees what does and doesn't. I asked you, how do you know that God knows okay. all things? Uh, again, it, God has revealed himself to us. Well, in how creation, do you, how, what makes you know that you know? I'm going to give you the answer. In creation, in conscience, uh, it's displayed in all that you're doing right now. You're, you're, uh, and it's how, also, how, is, also, how is what I'm doing to tell you that God knows everything? Well, well, I'm showing you, I'm, I'm explaining, you asked me how has God revealed these things to us, and I'm explaining he's revealed himself in creation. And I, I'm, I'm not asking how he revealed himself, I'm asking how, asking how do you know, that, know these things? That, he, that he has these attributes. And, there's nothing, and there's Omar, nothing Omar, I'm answering you, and I'm not sure that you're listening. There's nothing God, about the universe that listen, tells us listen, that listen, God would have certain Here's what I'm going to make it easy as possible, and it's something you should have known before you came to the debate tonight. God has spoken into history and revealed himself to us. In creation, in conscience, in his word, through his prophets, and ultimately in his son, Jesus Christ, who reveals the Father to us. God has spoken in history, and that's why. Let me tell you one thing about, about an infinite number of things. If God has infinite knowledge, that means there are an infinite number of things that he knows. That is a logical impossibility. Is this a question you're asking? I'm, I'm, I'm explaining to you why what you're saying is incoherent. You're sort of it's logical. questions right now. Well, I'm, I'm just making a statement about what you said. What you said doesn't make sense. Yeah, you make making statements. You should be asking questions. Okay. <laughs> You didn't make statements to be honest. Okay, I thought we were asking questions. <laughs> I thought the rule was questions. Is the mind of God a rational system? Is the mind of God a rational system? Yeah, is he rational? Well, in John chapter 1, verse 1, one of the documents that God has given us... You can just tell me yes or no. Have well, I'm going to give the answer. In John 1, 1, it says... In our Are you game, with yes or no? In our game, I don't want you to waste, waste my time. God is, God is rational and logical because it's part of this character. It's a rational system. Yeah. It's well, not a rational system. He is logical. And his, mind, his mind is a rational system. His mind is a rational system. Yeah, when you say he has a mind, that pre that that sort of presupposes that it's some kind of system which operates in a certain way. Yeah, well, and not that logic exists above God or below God. I'm talking about God's mind. Right, exactly, and I'm, I'm answering you. And our day in Halagos means in the beginning was the word. So it is a rational reason, system. Reason, order, yes, he is. Okay, good. is the, this rational system consistent and complete? Is God's rational system consistent in, in his, his mind? mind? Is it consistent and complete? Do, do you ask me if God thinks logically? No, I'm asking you if God's mind is consistent and complete. Yeah, sure, God's mind yes. is consistent. Okay. Yes. It's no rational system can exist which is both consistent and, com and complete. That's a logical impossibility. Therefore, your concept of God's mind is a logical impossibility. This, this being cannot exist. So what you're that's, saying, that's Omar, 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 Omar what you're saying basically is that if God's not like you, he can't exist? I, I didn't say anything like that. What I said is that if God's mind is a rational system, and if it's complete and consistent, then that's a logical impossibility. No logical system can ex exist which is complete and consistent. Cool. That's, that's good little second there. I don't know if it's a question, but it would seem like that would contradict itself. To we want to answer questions. 
there's questions we can put forth. Okay. If you want to rebut it? How, how does God know for certain that he's omniscient? How does God know for certain he's omniscient? I think the definition of omniscient would include that. Well, if you find he was omniscient, then he was omniscient. But that doesn't prove that he is. I think I might be omniscient. <laughs> to know to, to know all propositions with absolute certainty, God must know with absolute certainty that God is not mistaken is true. But he could not know that because if it were false, then he wouldn't know it were false. So that's a logical possibility. Uh, the uh, well, I don't know what the question is. <laughs> I'm just pointing out. You're making a statement. You have to ask yeah, I, I, I wanted to uh, ask you. Uh, if, if you think it's possible that the universe has a natural origin that you or we as a species just don't understand yet, do you think it's possible that there's a natural origin? Do I think it's... Uh, I, no, I do not think it's possible that nature has at its root nature. I don't think it's possible. Do you think it's possible that God could use a natural system, a self-sustaining system to create the universe? Yes, the supernatural God could use... God could do that. Uh, yeah, but see, you're starting... But the thing is, God is supernatural, so it's, it's not a natural system. What does supernatural mean? Uh, above nature is how I describe it. So, it's... God is not a part of nature. Two minutes. Uh, God is not part of the created order. I would define the universe as all created things. Okay, so God is not a part... Well, as an example, um, for... A, to the, the Christian worldview shows very clearly that God existed outside of of time and, and, and what he created. He created ex nihilo out of nothing. So supernatural, he exists, self-existent, from all eternity, none before, none after, and he speaks it into existence. Why couldn't the universe be self-created by itself? Why couldn't? Well, well it'd be a logical contradiction. Well, no, things pop into existence all the time through quantum mechanics. Well, wait, 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 can, can I... <laughs> you're saying, you're th saying that quantum mechanics, where there's already things there... You need to answer things. questions. Okay. What, okay, well, I don't know what the question is. Yeah. <laughs> my, question, my question is whether it's possible that God could create, could use a process like, say, quantum mechanics, which demonstrates things popping into existence out of nothing, could he use that process to create the universe? Is it possible could the universe... God use quantum mechanics to create the universe? Is it possible the universe could appear in a, in a way that doesn't require him to do anything? Is that a possibility? So, you... If you're saying God would be uh, chilling outside of space and time, and all yeah, of a sudden yeah. he's like, whoa, a universe is on my hands, where'd that come from? No. <laughs> no, well, he, would, he absolutely know where it came from. He absolutely know where it came from, because he, he created a self-creating universe. Is that possible? Could God create something that creates itself, yeah. is what you're saying, I think. And, 30 seconds. Uh, I would say, Omar, nothing can create itself. That seems like, that seems like properly basic. Really? Yes. Um, I would go from Paul Davies. I know you like him because you recommended his book to me. <laughs> Fifteen seconds. I can find it. I might have to read it. Can we, can we let him finish? Is that okay if we let him find a quote? Is that okay? Because okay. if... You want the quote? Go ahead and share it. We'll close our time with the quote. Time's up, except for the quote. <laughs> got it, got it right here. <laughs> Ah. Oh. The, ex the existence of a universe without an external first cause need no longer be regarded as conflicting with the laws of physics. This conclusion is based in particular on the application of cosmology to quantum physics. Given the laws, the existence of the universe is itself not miraculous. Thank you for the quote. Thanks for allowing it. In just a moment, we're going to take a 15 minute break before beginning part two of the debate. Part two will be a little bit shorter, and the format will be as follows. Each team will have eight minutes to provide additional rebuttals.